Okay, okay, no, listen, listen to me, Tui. We don't even need to go to set anymore. I mean, just look at this, hold on. Okay, and? Uh? Okay, no, 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 wait, wait, but hold on, hold on. Huh? 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 Yeah, yeah, okay, fine, I'll come to set. Just... Welcome to Teacup for One. My name is Matt and I have two degrees and welcome to week three of the great movie marathon, an epic 12 week celebration of the classic WDW attraction, The Great Movie Ride. We are taking you on a journey through some of the greatest films of all time and you do not even need a fast pass for this one. Each week I'll be watching a film from The Great Movie Ride in ride order and putting out a video inspired by each one. But that's not all. Some of my fellow Disney YouTubers are going to be coming along for the ride and putting out videos of their own for certain weeks. And for some movies we're even going to be coming together for a live stream to discuss the film like book club style. So just make sure you check out the links in the video description down below to see which other channels are participating for this week. So far we've looked at Footlight Parade and singing in the rain and this week the hollywood movie musical craze continues because the movie for this week why it's mary poppins that's right it's walt disney's academy award-winning film from 1964 starring julie andrews and dick van dyke great movie ride fun fact now just like the grauman's chinese theater in hollywood the chinese theater over at dhs features a courtyard filled with celebrity handprints. These celebrities include classic Disney stars like the Fab Five, uh, television and media personalities that were particularly popular when the park opened like back in 1989, so think of people like Regis Philbin, but also some legitimate Hollywood legends like Sid Charisse, um, Charlton Heston, Robin Williams, and Audrey Hepburn. Now, Audrey Hepburn is a particularly special one. Because, as the story goes, Audrey Hepburn was invited to leave her handprints at the Chinese theater at then Disney's MGM Studios just a couple of weeks before the park officially opened to the public. And they threw her a full handprint ceremony in the style of what's done at the Chinese theater in Hollywood. And in the middle of her ceremony, she started getting really emotional because apparently she had never been invited to leave her prints at the Grauman's Chinese theater in Hollywood. So getting to do it for Disney was an extra special honor for her. And when word finally got back to the folks who were running Grauman's Chinese theater, or maybe by then it was Man's Chinese Theater. I didn't do the research, I don't know. Basically, when word got back to the people who ran the pretentious theater in Hollywood, they realized their mistake. They invited Audrey to do a handprint ceremony for them, but by then, it was too late, and she said no. So, the fun takeaway here is that the only pair of Audrey Hepburn handprints exists at Walt Disney World. And I got a picture with them. Those are my feet. And it's actually quite fitting that we're opening the Mary Poppins episode by talking about Audrey Hepburn because if you don't know, Audrey Hepburn is kind of indirectly the reason that we got Julie Andrews playing Mary Poppins. I'm not going to spend too long talking about this story because a lot of people already know it, but basically, Julie Andrews came to prominence playing Eliza Doolittle on Broadway in My Fair Lady. Julie was a hit, the show was a hit, and so Hollywood pounced on that property and Warner Brothers decided, okay, we are going to turn My Fair Lady into a movie. However, Jack Warner of the Warner Brothers didn't want to take a risk by hiring Julie Andrews to play the lead role, Eliza Doolittle, on film because she was a relative unknown aside from her success on Broadway, like the masses hadn't heard of her, and she had never carried a film before. So instead, he went for a safer, more marketable choice, which was the lovely Audrey Hepburn. Now, in some ways, it seemed like a gross injustice, but in other ways, it was practically perfect in every way, because it meant that Julie was suddenly available to accept another contract that was on the table, playing the title character in Mary Poppins. Because Walt Disney, who apparently had a very different mentality from Jack Warner, had seen her as Guinevere in Camelot and just decided that she was worth the risk and she was the perfect person to carry his 
massive budget studio film. But in the end, it worked out for all parties. Julie was great in Mary Poppins. Audrey Hepburn was equally great in My Fair Lady. But the fun little bit of irony here is that once award season came around, Julie actually won the Academy Award and the Golden Globe for Best Actress over Audrey Hepburn. And Julie absolutely recognized just the irony and how that moment had come full circle, which she acknowledged in her acceptance speech. Finally, my thanks to a man who made a wonderful movie and who made all this possible in the first place, Mr. Jack Warner. <laughs> So that's the Mary Poppins Oscar story that everybody knows. But today, I want to focus on one of the other Oscars that Mary Poppins won. The Oscar for Best Visual Effects. The visual effects in Mary Poppins remain outstanding to this day. And in a lot of ways, I would go as far as saying that it's one of the best visual effects movies of all time. Am I qualified to make that assessment? Absolutely not. But this is my channel, no one is here to silence me, and I am running with it. Here's the reason I think Mary Poppins is so successful. There are so many state-of-the-art special effects techniques at work that your brain can't figure out what's going on at any given time, and so subconsciously, you just give in to the magic. Now, in terms of the specific techniques being used, Mary Poppins had the best of the best. The movie used established special effects techniques, which at that point had been perfected over a half century of filmmaking, while at the same time, pioneering new techniques that would go on to become integral to Hollywood blockbuster movies and Zoom meetings alike. I'm not a cat. It really seems to me like this movie is the bridge between classic and modern special effects techniques. And so really, with Mary Poppins, you get the best of both worlds. <laughs> Miley Cyrus. First, let's talk about the classic special effects. Now, when it comes to talking about special effects in Mary Poppins, a lot of people like to focus on the revolutionary techniques that allowed them to blend live action with animation. And yes, we will get there. But for myself, I think the much more impressive special effects in this film are the ones that you don't notice. The subtle ones. Basically, any time we're outside. Yeah. That's right. If you didn't know, anytime you think we're outside in this movie, we are not. Mary Poppins was shot 100% in studio, indoors. Anytime you see like a London cityscape or a street or anything that looks like it's outside, it's not outside. It is in fact a matte painting. Yes, I'm very proud of my work on Mary Poppins. Everything you're looking at are 100% original matte paintings. <laughs> okay, no, I'm just kidding. Basically, matte paintings were how filmmakers created larger-than-life settings for their films before computer animation came along to help out. And I personally think they hold up as far more effective than what we see now with CGI. But, I mean, of course I'm biased. They're matte paintings. There were different technical practices surrounding the use of matte paintings, but the core concept was always the same. Basically, you would set up your shot so that part of the frame was blacked off, and then the part of the frame that remained is where you would shoot your live action actors. Now, the part of the frame that was blocked off or covered in black was known as the mat. Later on, you would go in and fill in that mat with a painting. So then the portion of the painting would mix with the portion of the live action coverage in the film, and then it would come together to create a beautiful image because of the mat painting. This was a technique that dated all the way back to silent films, when George Melier played around with double exposure in The Man with the Rubber Heads and tapped into this concept that really became the backbone of filmmaking. This whole question of, what kind of images can I create if I expose a single frame of film to multiple images? From there, this whole idea of using multiple exposures to create composite images evolved, and evolved quickly. And matte paintings were a huge part of that revolution, and were vital to creating some of the most iconic landscapes in movies like Gone with the Wind and Dracula, and of course, Mary Poppins, which I think is a perfect example of the beauty and the effectiveness of matte paintings. And all of that beauty can be attributed to Peter Ellenshaw, one of the greatest matte painters of all time. And his name wasn't even Matt. 
Alan Shaw had already worked with Disney on multiple projects, including 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and Treasure Island, so he had already established a reputation for the quality of his work. And the quality of his work showed. When I go back and rewatch Mary Poppins, it really just makes me think that matte paintings are one of the most beautiful practices in film history. Like, they added this gorgeous expressionistic quality to movie settings, which ironically, to me, read as far more realistic than the stuff that we're able to get now with photorealistic CGI. Like, I think Peter Ellenshaw actually said it best. The trick in, in matte painting, if you know what you're doing, you mustn't make it too highly finished. It just gives the imagination time to work. Really, this isn't like a photograph when you really look at it. It's more alive, I think. So as though you're looking out at the actual scene. His talent is undeniable when you just look at the paintings that are just paintings, like the London sky, the clouds, whatever, whatever. But the stuff that really astonishes me are his matte paintings that were able to put actors in different settings. For example, the chimney sweeps dancing on the rooftops, matte painting. The interior of the bank, matte painting. Mr. Banks walking through the park to get to the bank, just David Tomlinson walking down a soundstage surrounded by, you guessed it, matte paintings. But like I said, Mary Poppins is so good because it combines classic composite techniques like matte painting with composite techniques of the future, pioneering the techniques that would eventually become chroma keying or blue slash green screen. The big difference here is that when you were working with matte paintings, you were working with static mats. So you were sectioning off the frame so that the live action happened here and the painting happened here. It was a static mat. But Mary Poppins showed us the incredible possibilities of using traveling mats, the technology we refer to today as Marvel films or green screen, whatever. Now, I don't want to misrepresent history and over-embellish things and give off the impression that Mary Poppins is the film that invented modern green screen, because it wasn't. But it did benefit from some incredible technological advancements that had happened around the time it was made, and it used the technology better than any film at the time. Now, massive disclaimer here. I am about to talk about scientific things that I only sort of kind of understand. So take everything I'm about to say with a grain of salt. But if you want a fully thorough scientific explanation of all the techniques I'm about to explain to you, just check out links in the description down below and subscribe while you're at it. Mary Poppins was shot in the early 1960s. By then, blue screen technology had already been around for about 20 years or so. It first premiered in the 1940 film The Thief of Baghdad and was used to bring the genie to life as this larger than life giant on the beach. It was incredible at the time. The only problem was that the blue screen technique used in Thief of Baghdad wasn't an exact science and created a fairly obvious blue halo around all the actors. So by the 1950s, Walt Disney was looking to improve on this traveling matte technology, and he hired engineer Petro Vlahos to come up with a more effective technique. And he did. In fact, the technique that Petro Vlahos came up with was so effective that it literally could not be replicated, and it was only used for a handful of films. And that technique was known as the sodium vapor process, or as I like to call it, yellow screen. Yes, you heard that correctly. You've heard of blue screen, you've heard of green screen, but for a short period of time, there was the far more effective yellow screen. Now, the whole reason that blue was selected for this whole blue screening process in the first place is because blue was the color that they deemed was least present in human skin tone. So you could do this whole color removal process without affecting how the people looked on screen. Now, by that logic, you would think that yellow screen would be the least effective method, right? Wrong. Because Petro Vlahos, in all of his scientific genius, realized that the blue light being used for the blue screen effects traveled at wavelengths with a range of 65 nanometers. So I only kind of understand what that means, but the way I interpret it is that blue screen technology basically had a margin of error of 65, which gave you imperfect separation between your subject 
and the background, which meant that you couldn't record like really fine details like hair or mesh fabrics up against the blue screen because of that margin of error of 65 nanometers. So instead, he turned to the yellow light produced by sodium gas, aka the light that we see pretty much every day in street lamps, because that light traveled at a single wavelength of 589 nanometers. So, in theory, it seems like it should work perfectly, but remember, the only reason that blue screen worked in the first place was because color film was made up of those three key components, blue, red, and green. In order to do that whole process with yellow light, you'd have to invent an entirely new camera. And he did. Vlahaus took one of those old Technicolor three-strip film cameras, now, just for the record, by this time, single-strip color film had been invented, and he rejigged it. He installed a prism into the camera. The prism split off the light so that the camera was able to record two strips of film simultaneously. One film strip was just standard color film, which wasn't extremely receptive to the sodium vapor light. So the image that was going on that strip of color film was of the actors and the main subjects in full color up against a more or less transparent background. Now, the other strip of film was black and white film, which was extremely receptive to the sodium vapor light. So on that film, we were getting beautiful silhouettes of the subject. So kind of think of it like that film was recording a fun shadow puppet show. So then they were able to take this black and white film and imprint the shadow puppet silhouettes using an optical printer up against the backgrounds, which meant that they then had a film strip with the background with the perfect cutout in the middle of the subject. Once that was lined up with the color film coverage of the subjects up against the transparent background, it just basically they, they, they made a giant puzzle and it looked really good. It was literally an exact science, which is why the Jolly Holiday scene in Mary Poppins looks so good. The fact that Julie Andrews is wearing a ton of mesh fabric that you can see the animation through is a technical marvel. So then you're probably wondering, okay, Matt, that sounds great, fantastic, but riddle me this. If this process was so effective and so good, why wasn't it used more? Why did we go back to using blue screen and green screen? And the answer is because apparently, Vlahos was only able to successfully create one prism that was able to successfully isolate that wavelength of the sodium vapor light. So pretty much, there was only one camera in the world that could be used for this process, and it belonged to Walt Disney. Disney did rent out the camera to other studios and other filmmakers at a fairly hefty price, as I understand it, the most prolific of which probably would have been Alfred Hitchcock on The Birds, but the exclusivity of the camera, paired with the fact that it could only work with 35mm film, meant that other studios were eager to just expedite the technology so that they could have access to the effect for their films and using other formats beyond 35 mil. So MGM actually hired Vlahos, of all people, to refine the blue screen process for their production of Ben-Hur. And his work on that film led to the chroma keying, blue screening, green screen, traveling map, whatever, to the effects that we still use today, I think. While all of this was happening, Disney was still using the yellow screen technology on some of their greatest movies. And even though the technique didn't really last, I don't think its effectiveness can be denied. So pair that with one of the greatest matte painters of all time, plus state-of-the-art animatronics and a slew of practical effects. And that's why I think Mary Poppins is one of the most magical special effects films of all time. Anyway, friends, this concludes yet another episode of Teacup 41. Now, let me know in the comment section down below, what is your favorite special effects film of all time? Also, don't forget to check out the other channels participating in the Great Movie Marathon this week. It basically means you get to go watch a bunch of other videos about Mary Poppins. What could be better? And if you want to follow me for the rest of the Great Movie Marathon, but you're not subscribed to the channel, what are you doing with your life choices? Make sure you subscribe to the channel right now. It's super easy. All you have to do is click on my face. Thanks for joining me today, everyone. My name is Matt, and I have two degrees, and that's the T cup for one. Go away. <laughs>